thank you for joining us for this um, Adelaide Bio, uh, Biomed City Research uh, mini review where we're presenting work that's underway under the banner today of SA Medical Imaging with a particular interest in nuclear medicine today. We have two presenters, uh, Associate Professor Gabby Chekic and Dr. Guy Chu. Uh, for those who I haven't had the chance to meet thus far, my name's Kristen Barris and I'm an academic and diagnostic neuroradiologist uh, who works at Royal Adelaide and um, part-time at University of Adelaide and Samri, and I'll be chairing this session today. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the central Adelaide region and their connections to the land, the sea and the community. And we pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. And an a friendly encouragement to you as well, our audience, to type questions in the Q&A section of your Zoom window down the bottom right of your Zoom window. And I'll try uh, to share some of those questions with each of our presenters today and some question time that uh, follows each of their presentations. This, um, this session will be recorded and made available on the ABMC website in due course. So it's my very great pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Associate Professor Gabby Chekic. Gabby commenced her career in physician training uh, in medical oncology, uh, training in Adelaide and later in Oxford, and then expanded her role into nuclear oncology and then work as a nuclear physician. She's got a special interest and expertise in neuroendocrine neoplasms. And she's the director of the statewide peptide receptor radionuclide therapy service based at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and the inaugural and ongoing chair of the statewide multidisciplinary tumor board for uh, neuroendocrine neoplasms. Um, in 2020, the Queen's birthday honors list, um, uh, on that list, Gabby became a member of the Order of Australia for her service to medicine nuclear oncology and specifically for the treatment of neuroendocrine neoplasms. Just a, a recognition of uh, Gabby's uh, career commitment to uh, nuclear medicine, nuclear, nuclear oncology and the uh, team that she works with. So we're really thrilled that Gabby's joining us today. Look forward to her presentation entitled The South Australian Neuroendocrine Tumor Service, Striving for Excellence. Over to you, Gabby. Well, um, thank you for inviting Guy and myself. We um, uh, really feel really privileged to be able to have a, a quick opportunity to present to you. Um, unlike most nuclear med pre presenters, I won't be um, showing you lots of lovely pictures. I just did really want to give a pathway um, and talk a little bit about the service as part of SAMI, uh, Theranostics and Precision Centres of Excellence. So just a few definitions because I'm quite mindful of the fact that we've got a range of different people online today. Uh, SA Medical Imaging came together as a collaborative of a range of um, radiologists and nuclear med physicians and we operate as a clinical support service across the local health networks and that involves um, central, northern and southern as well as women's and children's and country health. And um, uh, I'm based at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Theranostics is a term that we're all hearing more and more, and particularly within the nuclear med domain, molecular imaging provides a diagnostic pathway to help us really identify patients who will benefit from a targeted approach to therapy in what is now being increasingly used in the term of precision medicine, or as I say, theranostics. And if we digress and have a quick look at neuroendocrine tumour, a very heterogeneous group of diseases uh, with significant impact on quality of life. They've been rebranded and renamed over um, many years and the WHO classification currently classifies them as neuroendocrine neoplasms. Aside from the solid burden of disease, they are hormonally very active and this is responsible for imparting significant problems with quality of life. They're not rare and they're becoming increasingly commonly diagnosed because of the range of modalities that are used in the background. But you can see the Australian um, Institute of Health and Welfare puts them at an incidence of seven per 100,000. 
Our success in treating them means that they're second now only to colorectal carcinoma in their prevalence of 40 per 100,000. And it's estimated that about 10,000 people in Australia are currently living with a form of neuroendocrine neoplasm. Their survival is very much dependent upon their grade and this guides treatment intensity. We can definitely de-intensify treatment for those with lower grade disease because we can um, expect that they will live 15 to 20 years and we need to really reduce the toxicity, whereas those with higher grade disease need to have uh, intensity, in intensification of their treatment. We are, are, we, this is an example of a tumour that has a very clear target and that target is in the form of somatostatin receptor. And molecular imaging allows us to identify this target as a prelude to treatment. So many of you out there in the clinical sphere may have heard or be familiar with the octreotide scan. That was the earliest radionuclide, which was indium. That has definitely um, gone into the record books and, or in, sorry, into the museum. And we've moved forward into a pet tracer of gallium 68 dodotate. And that um, gives us a really important snapshot. It's important as well to remember that we also want to try and identify those patients with high grade disease. And given that many patients present with metastatic disease and their diagnosis may be based on a liver biopsy, it is really important we understand that these tumours are often very heterogeneous. So on the left hand side, we have an FDG PET study and aside from some physiological distribution, it's really a great marker to show that their disease is FDG negative. So when we put the molecular imaging together with the biopsy, we can have a real snapshot and a real guide as to what is the most appropriate way forward with treatment. So again, picturing that survival curve, for those with grade one and grade two disease, we can start their treatment by just using an analog along the lines of octreotide or lanreotide. These are not cytotoxic. These are tumorous, static, holding the tumor in place. It's very hard for many patients with advanced metastatic disease to understand that at best, all you're going to do is keep their disease stable, but it's the functional burden and the symptoms that we really need to address. Upon disease progression, they will often come to us for second line therapy and about one in five patients are eligible for radionuclide therapy. And as you can see from the slide, the traditional cytotoxic pathways are also amenable and sunitinib and everolimus on that slide have approval and funding. The current iteration of PRRT or peptide receptor radionuclide therapy is of lutetium as a radionuclide. It is um, a very useful um, tracer uh, or target radiopharmaceutical because it gives off a very short range of beta radiation, damaging the target cells and being very kind to the surrounding cells by not causing any damage. And it works by double-stranded DNA breaks. It is usually given alone rather than um, in high grade disease where it's given with radiosensitizing chemotherapy. South Australia has a very um, clear and rich history of providing um, excellent multidisciplinary meetings or tumour boards, um, in, um, other, otherwise known as tumour boards. And across South Australia in any fortnight, SA Medical Imaging supports about 50 to 60 of these MDTs. They're not all for cancer. And we are very lucky to have great engagement from a range of stakeholders. And newly diagnosed or progressive diseases are presented and we discuss options aside from um, radionuclide therapy, liver-directed therapy, different trials. Our guidelines and pathways are very contemporary and we always look uh, to see the most relevant pathways. And I highlight uh, ENET, so the European NET Society, as being uh, core and pivotal all the way through. Our patients come from far and wide, and it's really, uh, really important to all of us that we ensure that nobody is um, left out of this pathway. There are six PRRT centres within Australia. Many patients come to us with little knowledge in spite of having their disease for many years. And so a core part of what we do is education and linking them into some fabulous um, support, um, such as Hospital Research Foundation, Cancer Council South Australia and Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia. We keep our uh, connection, or they keep their connection with their core clinicians and the aim is to deliver four cycles with eight week intervals. And this is a very simple, simplistic image of one of our patients. The image on the left is of the disease, which is in the liver and widespread bony lesions. And this is the gallium pet. And that's 
essential. Without that image, we know that the target um, is not um, aptly expressed. The image on the right for this patient is probably one of the best prognostic indicators because it's the glucose PET. And aside from some physiological distribution and minimal uptake in the, in the um, uh, pelvis, uh, minimal disease. So on that survival curve, we would expect this patient would live for long, many years. So these two images of the gallium PET, the one on the left was the baseline and the one on the right showed her treatment response after three, four cycles, sorry, at, at three months and she had a spectacular response by imaging. But that's not what we're after here. We really are after an improvement in quality of life. And this particular patient with two young children was on heavy doses of analgesia. And the good news was at the end of her treatment, she was able to... Um, move on and do very well. This is a really important survey put out by the International Neuroendocrine Cancer Alliance or INCA and showing quite convincingly that our quality of life continues to be impacted. Um, a very quick um, path uh, walk through the PRRT pile, uh, Timeline. Australia was an early adopter of PRRT through the great collaboration with Erasmus, and we've been involved with it for many years. Unfortunately, as is often the way with neuroendocrine tumours, um, or sorry, in nuclear med departments, it took a long time for RCT, the first randomised controlled trial, to come through. It was published in 2015, and on the back of that, um, there's been American um, funding, but we're still waiting on funding. There are many collaborations and uh, trials groups out there. Um, and I can reference those uh, in the talk. And no talk on theranostics uh, would be complete without talking about prostate. Um, the target for this is the PSMA, and this is a doublet of lutetium and gallium again. And this is a very well-known image showing eight sets of um, um, images from eight different patients using a semi-quantitative evaluation. So the patient's images on the left showing widespread disease and then therapeutic benefit. There's so much to talk about. So I'm hoping that areas for exploration and discussion together is how we move forward in the development of a registry, how we can improve our stakeholder engagement and what it means to become a center of excellence. And if we can build on the strong collaborations that already exist amongst SAMI and with industry and institutions to look at different areas of um, research. So in summary, Australia is leading the world in theranostics, especially with prostate and neuroendocrine tumours. We've proven that we can deliver it safely, but there are many challenges and unmet needs, and so we really need to show that we can do it better. Uh, thank you to the wonderful team with whom I work, and um, we look forward to the Queen Elizabeth having um, a, uh, a new and wonderful building in the next two to three years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd encourage our uh, audience to submit any qu burning questions that you may have um, so that I can put them to Gabby. But I, I just wondered, Gabby, if it's possible for those of us who aren't well acquainted with the, the treatment aspect of the neuroendocrine tumours to walk us through what a, a typical patient will experience during their treatment. And, and um, do they get side effects from the treatments that are offered? Um, what, what does a typical patient during those eight weeks of, sorry, four cycles of therapy yeah. experience? Uh, a great question, and it's extremely variable. So the first consultation is extremely important in us establishing whether or not these patients are at risk of developing life-threatening carcinoid flare. And we know that because just in the time that we spend with them, they will flush and run to the bathroom enough times that that will be the indicator that we need. And that, and we're very, um, from day one, we've collected patient reported outcome measures and a tool, um, a quality of life tool. So stratify, try and work out those that are at risk. They get pre-admitted and they have a very strict protocol of trying to make sure that their hormone surge doesn't get them into any life-threatening situation. That's about maybe three to 5% of patients. For everybody else, it is extremely well tolerated. It's given intravenously, they're in for the day. There is, um, they're hydrated and they're given an amino acid to protect their kidneys. The first generation of this treatment uh, cause cause some renal toxicity. Um, some of them go to work uh, the following day. Um, oh. It's extremely well tolerated. The late toxicity generally in about three to five percent is of myeloid dysplasia or leukemia. Um, but through, the, through it, we're very aggressive with our anti-nausea regimes. Uh, uh, and so that's a pretty standard part, but most people tolerate it extremely well. Yes. 
Um, uh, I can see that through your career, you've noticed some absolutely revolutionary changes in the treatment of these tumours. Can you reflect on, on how outcomes have changed for patients when you were, say, in, in earlier times in your career involved in your endocrine neoplasms up to now? Like how, how have outcomes oh, changed for patients? Significantly. And there's some really, really good studies that look at the quaternary referral centres and the improvement in survival. So I suppose the Queen Elizabeth, in many ways, is a quaternary referral for these patients. Um, and there are very clear survival um, advantages uh, from even just from the analogue. So there are two studies called the PROMID and the Clarinet studies, and they really are only about 10 to 12 years old. Before that, many of these patients were treated um, with not much more than supportive care. So the hormone load has made a significant difference. And one of the things that we, I didn't get to discuss, um, but aside from the tumour bulk and the hormones, uh, carcinoid heart disease. And many of these patients would die from complications of the secretory elements. And we just seen a significant change in that. So the long-term survival of 15 to 20 years was unheard of before mm. in this space. Yes. Final quick question. It's a rather big question, but maybe you can just touch on some of the elements of the answer. Um, where, where do you see the biggest uh, future gains to be made in neuroendocrine neoplasm treatment? I think there is so much excitement around different radiopharmaceutical doublets. So again, thinking that the target is our receptor, that won't change. And the current radionuclide of choice for therapy is that beta emitter of lutetium. But we know that there are other beta emitters um, and there are also alpha emitters. And there's a lot of excitement around an agent called actinium. Unfortunately, yes. there is global, only a very globally a very small supply of actinium. But there are other radiopharmaceuticals in development. There's a lot of work on copper, 64 and 67, one as your diagnostic agent and one as your therapeutic agent. I'll just say as well, Kristen, and to everyone out there, that the, the foundations provided um, by neuroendocrine research has meant that, um, that it's often used, that they use the word or the term of disruptive technology when it, they talk about the management of prostate. Whereas there might be 10,000 people in Australia with neuroendocrine tumour, at any one time there are hundreds, many, many more men with prostate cancer. And I think we're going to see some very rapid changes there. Yes, Gabby, um, I have uh, um, so many more questions I'd love to ask you, but we have to save them for another I time. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you very much for your participation and um, really enlightening us. And thanks for all the work you do in this area. You're very welcome. Um, thank you for asking me to, to speak today. Thank you. It's, it's um, now a great pleasure of me to move on and um, uh, ask our next, next speaker to... Um, uh, lead us in a, in a, a new presentation. Um, Dr. Gi Chu is a staff specialist, um, nuclear physician at Royal Adelaide Hospital. And today, Gi has very kindly um, agreed to speak to us um, on his research work on ventilation perfusion spec CT lung quantitation studies and their correlation with other cardiac and lung physiological parameters. Um, thank you, Gi, for uh, speaking to us today. Thanks for the invitation. So today I would like to present uh, new developments that we've done on VQ scan uh, for lung functional assessment. So uh, VQ is a nuclear uh, study to look for clots in the lung with what we call pulmonary emboli. The test is in two parts. The first part is a ventilation scan, which is done by the patient inhaling a radioactive gas mixture called technic gas, which is made by combining vaporized carbon with the isotope technetium 99M. The second part is a perfusion scan where we inject particles of albumin labeled with technetium 99M, uh, which get lodged in the capillaries, and we look for a mismatch between perfusion and ventilation as a uh, diagnosis of emboli in the lungs. So in the past, we have progressed uh, from planar two-dimensional scans to three-dimensional scans, or what we call SPECT scans. SPECT simply stands for uh, a single photon emission computerized tomography, or simply what that means is it's a CT equivalent of a nuclear medicine scan. Now, the Q scan uh, can be used to quantitate amount of air and blood as well for the purpose of determining regional blood function, uh, lung function for preoperative assessment prior to, for example, lung volume reduction surgery or for lobectomy or pneumonectomy for cancer. To date, when you request a VQ quantitation stand, scan, the standard test is a planar two-dimensional scan that looks like this. 
uh, the, the lungs are then segmented neatly into six uh, boxes. Now, this is clearly not physiological because lungs do not come in neatly in six neat boxes. Um, so our departmental physicist has designed an IDL-based software to perform a three-dimensional low bar quantitation. This program fuses a lung CT with a VQ spec scan. The CT is displayed as a three-dimensional map for the operator to annotate the positions of the fissures. Uh, this, the program then fuses the segmented CT map to the V and the Q specs data sets, thus allowing low bar quantitation of ventilation, perfusion, and volume. For this presentation, I will call this our program the RAH VQ spec CT quantitation or RAH VQSQ. The result is a spreadsheet that looks like this, depicting the percentage volume, ventilation, and perfusion for each lobe. There are two fundamental questions of lung function from lobar quantitation that, can, that we can address. The first is how much lung damage has occurred in each lobe, and second, what is the contribution to gas exchange in each lobe? Now, these raw percentages on their own, I think, do not adequately address these queries. They need further analysis because low bar performance as a gas exchanger needs consideration of all three parameters together, not separately. So let's look at lung injury. This is a VQ scan of a patient with emphysema. The disease appears most pronounced in the, in the lower lobes. There's a positive radioactivity in the both ventilation and perfusion scans. But which lobe is sicker? In emphysema, there's a loss of lung compliance leading to gas trapping, a dead space which appear cold on the ventilation scan. To evaluate the amount of useful ventilation for gas exchange, it is the amount of the technic gas per unit lung volume that is important, not the absolute count. That is the equivalent to the concentration of counts that is important. Also in emphysema, there's shunting of blood from the disease segment, so these uh, segments look cold on the perfusion scan. It is the amount of blood per unit lung volume that is important, the concentration of the radioactive element. So in our novel approach to the analysis, we divided the percentage ventilation by the percentage volume to give us a concentration of air. And we did the same with the perfusion. And then we multiplied the two concentrations together. And the resultant number, we have coined the term ventilation perfusion differential index or VQDI. This number takes into account the amount, both the concentration of air and blood, the product reflects the achievable air blood concentration for the volume that the lobe occupies. The lower the index, the worse the emphysema. Let's now address differential lobe bar function. The VQ spec acquisition is done with the data acquired populating a three dimensional matrix of cues, cues which we call voxels that represented by uh, this, uh, this cartoon. Our program can multiply the amount of technic gas and amount of radioactive albumin in each voxel, sum those products of all the voxels that make up the load, and then divide that number by the volume of the load, which we can estimate on a CT map. The result is a percentage of each load of amount of air and blood per unit lung volume. And this percentage, I think, will reflect the differential contribution of gas exchange from each load. This percentage, we have coined the term V. Uh, ventilation perfusion capacity differential index or VQCDI. Going one step further, if we divide the VQCDI by the volume, if the lobe is normal, the ratio should be 1.0. A lobe that occupies 20% of volume should provide 20% of total gas exchange. A lobe with a ratio that is well below one is an inefficient lobe, a lobe with, with dead space, in, uh, as in, for example, in the emphysema. So in nuclear medicine quantitation, we, uh, but next I'd like to talk about the validation. In nuclear medicine quantitation, uh, we deal with a lot of noisy data because of the limited amount of radioactivity that we can administer to, in the interest of radiation safety. So the first question is, is our method reproducible? So in 2017, we published a study on the reproducibility of our program where we got two nuclear physicians and one radiologist training in nuclear medicine. All three of us processed uh, blind, in blinded fashion twice data sets of 12 VQ scans from patients with advanced disease having a VQ scan uh, of, uh, as part of lung transplant assessment. And we showed a very strong to, a strong to very strong correlation of results, translating to a good inter-observer and good intra-observer concordance. So our test is reproducible. The next question is, are we measuring what we think we are measuring? Uh, we compared our technique against a commercially available program called QLung from a commercial co company called GE. 
Uh, this program has been certified by the FDA in the US as a medical device uh, using VQ scans. So what we do uh, did was uh, we got the VQ scans of 19 subjects with advanced airway disease. And uh, we did the, uh, the scan process by me with our technique and uh, two of our technologists independently and blindly processing the same data sets. Uh, uh, and then we compared uh, our results uh, between the three of us. And as a quick visual demonstration, our results were uh, uh, quite concordant, supporting the accuracy of uh, VQ, uh, RH, VQ, SQ. Now, what are the clinical applications for this technique? There are two clinical applications uh, that we are actively researching. Uh, we looked at the use of this technique uh, for preoperative assessment uh, for patients uh, having bronchoscopic lung volume reduction with endobronchial valves. Uh, our paper was accepted for publication this year. Our aim was to validate the use of VQ in the assessment on patients. So in patients with advanced emphysema who remain symptomatic despite maximum medical therapy, collapsing one lobe by placing a one-way valve is a treatment that is effective, safe, and reversible. CT is currently the test of choice for selecting the best lobe to treat. We found that our technique can provide similar information to CT, albeit from a perspective of lung physiology rather than lung anatomy. So CT uses lung attenuation to determine presence of emphysema to identify the most diseased lobe as the target lobe and to look for disease uh, in heterogeneity in the adjacent lobe. Our technique, the VQDI, uh, uses concentration of air and blood for the same assessment. And just like CT, our technique can also assess the lobe volume. The only thing we can't do is a VQ cannot assess a, a fissure integrity. What that means is that if there's a hole in the fissure, this, uh, the valves will not work because it gets air uh, filling from the adjacent lobe. So we did a, a study where we had 18 subjects uh, who were presented for uh, this uh, volume reduction treatment. And the assessment was based on quantitative CT. Um, uh, after the treatment was done, I was asked to blindly choose the target lobe based on VQDI and the knowledge of the fissure integrity without knowledge of, uh, and blinded to all other information. And comparing uh, VQDI versus uh, quantitative CT, we found a concordance of 89% of pepper statistic equivalent of 0 0.85. So, uh, uh, this concordance uh, does validate using VQ as an assessment technique for this particular treatment. In clinical practice, we have a monthly multidisciplinary meeting that decide on target loops of potential patients put up for this treatment. We use complementary data from both quantitative CT and our, our VQ technique. Uh, from VQ, we can assess the sickest lobe with the lowest VQDI. We can look for heterogeneity of disease by looking at the VQDI of the lobe next to it. We can look for the lobe with the worst differential function with the lowest VQCDI. We can look for the lobe with the largest state space by looking at the VQCDI to volume ratio. And we can look for the lobe with a good volume to collapse to improve mechanical ventilation. We're currently involved in another clinical study looking at the effects of bronchoscopic lung volume reduction on lung and cardiac physiology. The target lobe for this particular trial uh, is based on data and analysis of quantitative CT as well as VQ with our technique. The next application is pre-lobectomy assessment. So we did a pilot study to look at the value of VQ spec CT lobe quantitation for predicting post-operative lung function parameters in patients undergoing lobectomy for non small cell lung cancer. So the aim was to estimate the post-lobectomy lung function. There are two parameters, the FEV1 uh, and DLCO are two parameters that have been shown to have prognostic value. So we had six subjects who went on to have lobectomy for cancer. All patients had pulmonary function tests before surgery and six months after surgery, and all had BQ spec CT before surgery. And uh, using the, our index, the VQCDR index for differential function, we used that index to estimate how much lung will be left after surgery to estimate what the post-operative FEV1 will be like and compared it to the measured FEV1, and we just did the same for DLCO. DLCO can be uh, expressed as with hemoglobin uh, correction and without hemoglobin correction, so that's why there are three results here. And the null hypothesis really was that the estimated uh, FEV1 and 
the measured FEV1 are the same. And uh, we found that indeed, if you look at the, uh, these graphs, they look uh, pretty much concordant uh, with uh, no statistically significant difference between the estimated and the measured with very high uh, coefficient co uh, coefficients, uh, correlation coefficients uh, for the comparison. We also did the same uh, estimate using volume percent and we also got uh, very similar results. So uh, the, uh, the conclusion would be that we, with our technique, we can potentially uh, predict what the post-operative FEV1 and DRCO is, and therefore we can prognosticate the risk uh, of uh, patients with borderline lung function in terms of getting curative surgery for lung cancer. Uh, we, sorry, missing one slide here. Uh, here we go. Yes, uh, to, do, to further this uh, 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 endeavor, we are uh, recruiting patients uh, for, who are being considered for curative treatment, either with surgery or stereotactic radiotherapy or with radio ablation uh, to see if we can estimate what the post-treatment uh, FEV1 and DLCO will be. So in conclusion, RHVQSQ is an in-house developed program for VQ spec CT low bar quantitation that has been shown to be reproducible and accurate. We have, out of this process, created indices like VQDI, VQCDI, and VQCDI volume that have got potential clinical value in the uh, sphere or spheres of bronchoscopic lung volume assessment, reduction assessment, and for prelobectomy assessment. Okay, thank you very much um, for, a, for a whirlwind uh, review of some fantastic research you're doing. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I've got two quick questions in the limited time that we have available, if I may. The, the first one relates to lungs as dynamic structures and with anatomical variation. Um, have, is there any relevance to the, the dynamic nature of the lung and um, it, the variation um, or limitations in emphysema and lung cancer patients and anatomical variation of the lobes, particularly given you're trying to segment them all um, using um, computed sort of techniques. Um, how well does the system account for all these variations? It, the VQ scan is acquired over like 15 minutes. So the, uh, the second to second or breath to breath variation does not really matter. Yeah. Uh, the, the quantitation that we do is a net quantitation of each lobe. Uh, so uh, it, it will matter in, in, in high, high energy CT. Uh, the inspiration will look different from the expiration, uh, but in VQ scans, uh, not really. Got it. Yep. And, and my other question is about the, the clear nature of how your, your, the research you've presented is the product of an amazing collaboration with nuclear medicine physicians, clearly some respiratory physiologists, surgeons, a physicist. Um, can you just reflect on the nature of the collaborative work and, and how that's made a whole lot of um, amazing work possible? I think the, uh, the, the credit should go to our physicists who came up with the program. Uh, I merely found a clinical value, a clinical uh, use for his program. And our main collaboration really is with the lung physicians. Uh, and uh, yeah, so th that's where the collaboration uh, has occurred. Yeah, yeah. A, a really good um, uh, demonstration of, of how collaboration across different skill sets um, across our uh, health precinct has, has uh, made some fantastic research possible. And congratulations, Guy, on what, what you've achieved and what you're continuing to do and expand into, into the treatment realm as well. So hats off to you, Guy. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Um, and in concluding now, um, I'd like to remind everyone that this presentation gets uploaded to the ABMC website for your subsequent perusal. Um, <clears throat> and remind you that next Tuesday's presentation is going to be focusing on infectious disease uh, with Associate Professor Michael Beard and Dr. Danny Wilson presenting a session chaired by uh, Professor Andrew Zanatino. I'd really like to thank everyone for joining us, for our two um, amazing speakers, Gabby and Guy. Thank you very much indeed, and for all of you joining us. I hope to see you next week.